My name's Deborah. I'm a video journalist with the FT. But I think the reason I've been asked to chair this is more to do with the work I did in Mexico, which was a sort of standalone journalism website that fed into all the social media platforms and um, covered Mexico f using multimedia. Um, but I was very active on Facebook and Twitter and Flickr and Vimeo and all the other media networks, um, social networks. Um, so what I'd like to start is, I'd like to start by asking the, the panelists to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about your involvement in, in social media. We can start at this end. Hello, I'm Sina Motalebi. I'm uh, head of uh, Persian Television Old Sports in BBC. Uh, before joining B BBC, I was a journalist in Iran, and uh, I had a blog, uh, um, which I started in early 2002 until 2003, when I was arrested and spent uh, a little more than three weeks in solitary confinement in Tehran. Uh, before leaving the country, I went to Holland, uh, restarted uh, my blog. Uh, then my father was arrested for more than 10 days, and. Uh, and after that, I left Holland and came to BBC oh, for four years. During the Iran election and the protest after that, I was editor of the uh, user-generated content in BBC Persian TV. So um, uh, I was responsible for the team, for the interactive team who gathered and verified and broadcasted back the material uh, which was produced by uh, citizen journalists in Iran. Hi, I'm Benjamin Chesterton. Uh, I run a company along with David White, who's on the front there, called Duck Rabbit. Lots of people would like to put me on in solitary confinement, but it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> uh, some of them in this room, actually. But um, we uh, do three different things. We train people to make multimedia, predominantly photo films, and we've worked producing this kind of work for organisations like Medicine Sans Frontier. We've worked on a campaign in uh, about Eastern Congo called Condition Critical. And we also are, produce radio documentaries and um, multimedia to go with them. For the BBC World Service, we have a series going out this uh, Christmas called Open Eye. Um, hi, I'm Sunny Handel. I run a blog called Liberal Conspiracy, and uh, which is a pretty big uh, left-wing blog in the UK. Uh, and I'm entirely a social media creation. I uh, started, um, <laughs> as in not a creation, but um, as in I, I, I've not, not actually done journalism, but I, I got picked up by The Guardian as a, as a, as a writer for them uh, entirely through my blog, um, and then started up Liberal Conspiracy about two years ago, which has grown massively. Uh, and we do a lot of, you know, I'm also active on Twitter and Facebook, although now I hate Facebook. Um, and but. You know, our blog is very tightly, uh, you know, uh, linked with the social media sort of sphere generally. So anyone who comments on a story or links to a, a blog story on, on our blog then comes up on the blog and they can now also tweet the story directly from the blog post itself. Um, you know, most of our referrers now come via Twitter or Facebook. So for me, it's a, a, a vital way to not only grow the blog, but also uh, to bring in new readers and also spread the story. So you can also see the way our blogging has changed because a lot of it was initially very much uh, written in a sort of a, a inside, inside sort of joke, sort of a headline. But now all the headlines are changed, and so they're very factual and made entirely for Twitter. You know, so um, the whole social media has changed uh, the blog world itself massively. I think. Um, so. Yeah. Uh, and I'm Mike Harris. I am Head of Campaigns at Index on Censorship, the anti-censorship charity, uh, and also manager of the Libel Reform Campaign, which has used uh, social media to gather 52,000 supporters across the country. Uh, and now we have uh, we got three manifesto pledges at the last general election on the basis of our campaigning work, which uh, has led to a Libel Reform Bill on the agenda for January. So we've had actual government legislation come out of our social media campaigning. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna, I want to start with the whole, uh, you know, voice of the people and, and, a, and a, a way of raising awareness and that issue and then we'll move on to sort of the journalistic and sort of citizen, citizen media issue afterwards because they're both really, really big issues. Um, 
It's, I mean, it seems to me that, that the great thing about Twitter is people have the, the chance to broadcast their individual voice, albeit you know, 140 characters, as, as Ben Shakes has said. I'll come to you in a second. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to know whether you have any, whether you can give us some examples of, you know, creating a buzz online and, and taking that into the, the other world and, and creating real sort of political change. And that is open to the floor, because I know all of you have examples. Well, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, there was the famous one of Jan Meyer, the, the Daily Mail journalist, who uh, wrote about Stephen Gately's uh, death and said that it was probably something to do with his uh, sexual lifestyle. And that blew up massively on Twitter. We also blogged about it quite a few times in the space of one day uh, on Liberal Conspiracy. And eventually, 25,000 people compa uh, complained to the Press Complaints Commission. You know, we also encouraged people to, um, to um, write to the advertisers on the Daily Mail website and saying to them they should take the ads down from that site. Um, eventually, the Daily Mail did actually take the ads down from that site. There was another example of the BBC running a, a debate on their BBC Africa site which was uh, headlined, should gays be executed or something like that, <laughs> which was in response to a, a local uh, discussion within Uganda. But we thought, well, that's sort of the BBC then sort of feeding into that narrative that it's OK to somehow debate that question. And uh, made a big deal about it on Twitter. And uh, eventually, the BBC uh, not only changed the headline on the day and took the discussion down, but uh, later on admitted there was a, a mistake for them. Um, and Didn't uh, the trust uphold that complaint? Uh, sorry, say that that was that that, that headline was absolutely fine. I mean, they, they've just put that out, haven't they? They might have, but the editor themselves actually mm -hmm. uh, wrote a blog post saying we were wrong to okay. to do that. Uh, and there's you know there's lots of other examples where, uh, but we actually focus a lot on the media. We you know there are there are some o offline uh, examples where, for example, just before the Labour. Uh, Nominations closed for leadership. We encouraged people to go out and um, lobby MPs so they can get a left-wing MP like Diane Abbott or John McDonald on the list. And so a lot of people were actually MPs were complaining that they were getting far too many people calling them up and saying, you know, why are you supporting uh, a wider range of debate within the party? Um, so I mean, that's not Twitter as such. That was more Facebook. But mm -hmm. we actually got lots of people to send me, uh, you know, send me. Um, details of uh, uh, phone numbers of MPs saying, you know, you can contact them here, this is their email address. And lastly, there was the famous, uh, not so famous in the mainstream media, but example where we stopped uh, Rod Little becoming editor of The Independent. <laughs> and so that was a social media campaign across the board. We, uh, there was a Facebook group that we promoted, which became quite popular. Uh, we uh, blogged a lot about things that he'd said online uh, under a pseudonym on various football websites and and then we also joined up with a, a, an email campaign group called 38 degrees to then lobby uh, the guy who's gonna buy um, the independent to say that you know he should not be editor of the independent so there was like a, a mixture of various campaign groups coming together to um, you know to to get that outcome yeah, okay. what, what I will say is all of those are quick wins the situations yeah. where there's a there's a an issue an individual becoming editor of a newspaper, there is a quick campaign, click one button, you know, join the campaign. When social media will come of age when it is able to influence the detail of government policy. That's where the power comes from. Because mm. at the moment it's individual legislators, it's uh, lobbyists, it's uh, pressure groups. They get into the detail of, leg you know, of, of, of the lawmaking process. Social media just doesn't have any purchase on it. Because if you say to someone, um, can you write your MP about Section 42 of the Criminal Justice Act and a campaign of the use of the word and instead of all, it's, it's too complex. People go, well, you know, sorry, can you explain this to me? And, and it, it, the, the, where social media will become powerful is where you build an engagement with an individual which is more than just clicking a button, doing an email petition, twittering something. It's got, there has to be a kind of conduit which... But uh, is that actually possible? Yeah. yeah well, it is, but at the problems. moment we don't, we haven't quite worked out where that lies. I mean, the well, campaign... In a, in, in a way, Suni's example has a very easy solution in the sense that you tried to stop someone becoming editor <laughs> and it was, you know, it was a very simple you wanted a very simple reaction from people, whereas 
determining and influencing government policy is a lot is a much more complex conversation that needs to take place between between many more parties. And it does, but that's where, I mean, it's at that point that you say that social media is powerful, mm -hmm. because at the moment the people that have their hands on the levers of power are often, in, you know, often corporations or well-connected individuals who can go and meet the Secretary of State or who can, uh, who can go to the European Union and lobby on, a, on an issue. And actually, it won't be, until, it won't be to the point until us as, as, as individuals can actually start influencing directly the words contained in bills mm. passed in our name that we're, we're at the point where social media can be said to be incredibly powerful. Okay. I mean, the campaign that, we're, that we've run on libel, we've actually got a bill. So that's a kind of concrete outcome. But whether we're able to change the wording of it is a, is a, different, is a different matter. What do you think, Ben? You've been shaking oh. your head. <laughs> I don't like this idea of coming of age. You know, I just think things are where they are in developing. Well, do we talk about film coming of age? Do we talk about literature coming of age? Do we talk about theatre of coming of age? I think you know, we're in this progression of which social media does have a role to play. I think it's very dangerous to isolate it and just say, OK, this social media will do this in the future. Whatever people are doing different things, it's just one element of, for example, campaigning. It's, it's potentially an important element. Um, so I, I kind of, you know, struggle a, um, a little bit with that idea. And it goes be far beyond minutiae of um, policy. Anyway, we have seen examples of that. We've seen, uh, that, um, for example, the photographers have fought very hard to have um, stop and search on photographer. They've done a really good campaign. I think that has influenced, uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, policy. But beyond that, I think there's so many other things in life beyond politics and policy that affect people's um, lives and, 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 and change them. Um, so I don't think we should be judging the success or otherwise of social media purely on that. Far more interesting what goes on sort of in, in, in Iran and on that basis we might say uh, social media hasn't come of age because it didn't affect uh, the, the final outcome of, of the election but we've seen a shift forward, we've seen, we've seen a a change. I don't know if that's fair or not. It's part of that story and journey forward. Well, I'd, I'd like your view on this because you, you were saying earlier that after you were arrested, in, in parts, your presence on. I mean, when I talk about social media, I'm talking about everything online, really, that's, that's not published by maybe an official media ad. I'm talking about blogs, I'm talking about Twitter, I'm talking about Facebook, I'm talking about everything that allows people to have communities and, and, and connections with each other. This is an interesting question, how you can uh, um, assess the success of social media, you know. But I think there are different views about the role of social media and, and, uh, and its functions in today's world. And one is what you explained. And, and I remember the time that uh, the same expectations were on uh, Iranian blogs. Were. So people were talking about Iranian bloggers in a way that they were talking about Iranian reformists, they were talking about, like, like a political party, like a, like a pressure group or something. But um, I think the life for people in social media is, is, is somehow parallel to their life in the real world. You know, you don't expect people in the real world, you know, the, the, the society to do something that you believe it has to do and then uh, assess the uh, success of the society based on your expectations. In the same way, I don't think we can reduce the social media and the life on the social media uh, to our expe political or um, ideological expectations. Uh, and uh, because, you know, uh, another day you can have a discussion about the social media and economy or social, social media yeah. and sports. Uh, I don't think social media uh, was unsuccessful in Iran, for example. I, I can see that many people, especially Iranians, uh, are disappointed. Uh, that they, th they thought in the eve of events that uh, this uh, fast-moving uh, buzz on the internet can, can create something, can change yeah. something. But uh, when people ask me that uh, why it has, hasn't uh, made a real change, I said, it has, you know. The fact that uh, you know, it, uh, it broke the exclusive, uh, um, you know, the, the exclusive power of the government on the media. 
Mm, in a very close society, now you have a situation that everybody can, uh, can raise their voice and can send their message out. And that was the result of, of the so, uh, social media activities during the election. Um, and I think, uh, I don't think ever social media can, for example, go and change a government, but they can change some of the situation, some of the characteristics of a society in a such, such a radical and revolutionary way that opens the way for others whose job, whose day job is changing the government, you know, the political parties, pressure groups, to go and change the, the behavior of the government. In my case, you, you refer to, I think the, the mere fact that I'm sitting here is, is because of the social media, bloggers for there, then. Uh, you know, what the story I was telling you before was, you know, when I was arrested, okay, I was a Berlin journalist in Iran, I was working for a newspaper, I was not like, a, like an anonymous blogger, but there were many, many uh, higher profile journalists arrested before me and spent months in jail. And uh, in the first day, on the first day, the interrogator told me that uh, they just arrested, um, a few months before that, they arrested a very high profile political figure and journalist called Abdul Sabi. And he made some confessions in TV, Iranian TV. And he had, you know, the history of fighting against Shah's regime. He was a you know, veteran political fighter. He was not like me, a 30-year-old in Tehran. And, and then, uh, at the time, uh, then, <laughs> 940. <laughs> the, then uh, they told me that, you know, you are not no stronger than Apple Sabdi. We will break you. You know, in no time you will go to TV and you, you will make your confessions. <laughs> okay, I confess 350 pages, but fortunately not <laughs> in TV. And, and I came out in 23 days only because they, they didn't estimate the power of the social media. You know, the mere fa the fact that I was the first blogger ever arrested anywhere, you know, became a story. You know, Jeff Jarvis picked mm -hmm. it up in mm -hmm. Buzz Machine and then started a campaign. Uh, it went to traditional media, Newsweek, Wall Street Journal, BBC, others, and then uh, they couldn't believe that there is a petition uh, for my release with 4,000 signatures. Uh, and then they had to release me. Uh, other fact that my wife, who is a journalist also, uh, she had a blog, nothing about politics or journalism. It was about our son. It, she started the blog a day before my son was born, and my son was six months old. So the blog was full of, you know, images of my six months old son and then posts about uh, well, my son is missing me uh, and they have no news about me uh, uh, or one day they met me in, in the court and my son was happy and the emotional effect of that blog it was like inviting all the journalists of the world to our house and it put a lot of pressure mm -hmm. on the Iranian government so it has that power I don't think that because the time span that you can concentrate that pressure on your government is very short, uh, means that it is, it is not successful. Isn't it true that we're going to keep inventing new things, okay, that new forms of communication that can have an impact, and we're going to keep assessing them as a failure or otherwise. We've done it with photography. Has photography failed to change the world? And all of those things, they're just tools. It's people. We could have made all these difference decades ago. It's got nothing to do with social media. It's got nothing to do with photography, literature. It's up to us. And that's where the failure lies in people. Of course, we can use social media to say, you may want to change the law. Social media, it may be actually that social media is succeeding because people are arguing, actually, I don't want that law changed. I disagree with you. You've got a point of view. You present it almost as if it's successful when your point of view becomes then the dominant one. In fact, isn't the point of it that actually social media create where we can have difference of opinion? And I that's think, what exists. I think the point I'm trying to make is that social media is, is uh, very effective in running uh, campaigns that are sort of slightly short term, but, but for longer term campaigns, like, for example, in Iran, um, you know, there hasn't become, there hasn't, social media hasn't converged around a single point or a single nexus which has allowed a longer term uh, campaign about what Ahmadinejad's regime is doing in Iran. And that's the issue. It's, it's the filling in between the short term. So your individual narrative, your, uh, the story about how you were arrested and, and your, your freedom. It's quite interesting. Uh, the US State Department, the FCO, 
uh, they all entirely recognise the power of social media. They're saying, look, for individual bloggers, for individual uh, women who are being stoned to death, or for individual activists, it's incredibly important, and not just in Iran, in Burma, in, in, other, in, in, in other sort of dictatorships. The issue is, how do you turn short-term campaigns around individuals into something more long-term about um, changing the behaviour of very powerful state actors? We can't judge that, though, because it's long-term. How can we make a... By the very thing that you're saying, we can't make that judgment now. No, we can't. We, we but what I'm know, saying is that social media will have, will be. I, I think we should be pushing for social media to be able to do those forms of long-term campaigns. What do you think? Uh, but I think, uh, actually, the power of social media is because uh, if you start a campaign in social media, you can gather people from di different backgrounds and different uh, uh, willingness to involve in politics in a short-term focused campaign. If you exactly. want to mm. make it a longer-term campaign, you maybe will lose the power of social media, which is the backing of all those people who don't care about a long-term plan and they don't want to be involved in that. So you will reduce it to, again, uh, a, a smaller group of people whose you know, day-to-day job is, is uh, dealing with politics. So it's just like, having an online party or an online political organization instead of using social media. It is just, you know, if we forget about social media and come to, like, real life. For me, social media is real life, but uh, what they call real life. Uh, and then... Or augmented reality. Yeah. Yeah. This, um, these campaigns, those short-term focused campaigns, is like a revolution. It's like protests in the street. You cannot have that for changing every single law. You cannot have protests every day. Because people who are doing lots of other things and they don't care about politics every day, they come to the street to change something right now, something they know, a, a very uh, focused uh, objective they have, and they want to achieve it now. And if it takes like three months time, they will be tired, they will go back. Yeah. Then for something else, for a longer term plan, you, you, you have political parties, you have pressure groups. And they, you know, if we come online, they can have online <laughs> sites, they can have a network of supporters, fans around mm. them. But then, every now and then, they can start a campaign in social media and such. And, and bring all those other people who just for this Absolutely. focused objective, uh, they want to, they want to uh, join the campaign. Yeah. So that is the power of social media. I, I, think I, 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 don't under, I, I don't underestimate the power of social media. My concern would be that increasingly my own personal inbox is being the number of short-term campaigns that I'm being asked to join is increasing exponentially. I'm sure everyone in the audience has exactly the same. It's, it's about, I don't underestimate the power of short-term campaigns. What I do, what I do worry about is that we, is that we get into a situation where the power of, of the quick win becomes almost like a political end in itself, mm. and we don't focus on the importance of the long-term power structures that exist. But, but, but the two are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Uh, with, with our aim is our, our aim on liberal conspiracy is not to just uh, get rotted out of, of any <laughs> position in any newspaper. I mean that would be silly, but the point is to change the a political climate uh, in a longer term view. I mean I've, I've written lots of times about how the left in the UK doesn't have infrastructure in terms of blogs, in terms of think tanks, in terms of developing a, a stronger infrastructure that then leads to political power and change. Now that involves uh, flexing your muscles at certain times, which might involve sort of ousting Rod Little or it might involve harassing the BBC about something. Um, we're, we're for, for example, constantly blogging about how the BBC uh, runs a lot of climate change denial stuff and then getting people who will then complain about mm -hmm. it on a constant basis. So the BBC actually feels that they need to look at their uh, their, their journalism around climate change. Now that is a longer term view. Someone's got to take that longer term view and say, all right, this is our aim over a longer period of time to change the way the, the political direction is taking place. You know, you constantly attack the right wingers about their climate change denial. You point out where they've gone wrong. These are quick win battles, but unless you have a long term view about where you want to take it, then obviously it's not going to go anywhere. 
but you do actually have to have a long-term view about shit, climate change is a big issue. And in, in order to deal with that, we have to, for example, take down all these people who spend a lot of time just denying it and spreading lies and untruths about what's going on in the climate. So then you have to systematically take that down, systematically undermine them, and systematically try and change the big media's narrative in order for any political change to take place. You see what I'm trying to say? It, yeah. It's a long-term battle, but the, the, actually, are important. If you, if you, yeah, exactly. If you look They're at important. the history of the, how the Republicans grew massively over the 70s and 80s, it was through that. It was actually through lots of small, quick wins, but also then changing the political climate uh, over a longer period of time, over two decades, until you get Reagan, who just completely uh, smashes the Democrats uh, in 84. I mean, that's just getting into political sort of stuff. But you know, the, the point is that. You do have to think big, but it does require short-term wins and, and short-term focus as well. But I mean, I think that's my, my, my point. My point is, you've got to link it into a broader, wider, deeper narrative around ideas, around concepts. Lots of what will happen with social media is there will be the growth of campaigns will be exponential, and so there's going to come a point where I mean, 38 degrees are in an interesting position because actually they've sort of taken a little bit of territory, they've taken a little bit of ground around short wins, but linking it together into a longer term, inverted commas, progressive programme. Yeah. And that, that seems to be kind of the, 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 the step forward. Yeah, it's or, infrastructure or bars, or, for me. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's these sort of campaigning organisations and linking it into a wider programme. But it's, that, will that needs to develop even further so that these pressure groups become essentially more like, I mean, what's quite well, interesting well, is well, think tanks didn't, you know, 38 degrees could have been a front for a think tank, but think tanks didn't, didn't concentrate on the quick win and they didn't, they weren't equipped to deal with social media. Uh, well, I mean, look, let's, let, let, I mean, Iran is a fantastic, uh, worthy example, but, you know, the percentage of people who blog in Iran isn't that much. Let's compare that to a country where social media is highly developed, America, mm -hmm. and over the US election, um, <coughs> You know, you had a whole bunch of different people doing lots of different things. So Move On was constantly taking out ads, putting pressure on Democrats to, uh, you know, do this, do that. Uh, you had uh, online uh, groups like Act Blue, which uh, eventually funneled about a hundred million dollars of contribution towards Democrats, uh, and over uh, more mm. than that towards Obama. You had all these email list groups, which are helping Obama become uh, connected. I, I went out to the United States and I, I went out to campaign for him entirely because I could see what was going on on the ground and the information I got through social media helped me connect to the campaign and then volunteer without actually but having to go to I, anyone. I, so, you know, you've yeah. you got you to be clever about how you do it, but that was a fantastic example of the user what, What's internet. quite interesting is I, I was there as well in Virginia and the thing that stood out to for me, wasn't the use of social media. I don't want to be a naysayer, but it wasn't use of social media. It was the fact that I turned up to this uh, the, the town of fifty thousand people, Centerville. Um, turned up, you know, very mid, you know, kind of middle class, the sort of area in Britain which is just traditionally incredibly apathetic towards politics. And I went to a campaign session. There were ninety people in the room about to go out and canvass. And as a member of a political party, you never get 90 people out to canvass. Like the general election, you might have got 15. Like that, that you'd be doing well. 90 people. And I, said, I spoke to the agent. I said, this is amazing. You're 90 people out to canvass. So yeah, this is one of three campaign sessions. We'll have 300 people out in a town of 50,000 people. So you've got one person per 110 people, 120 people. You know, it was actually about not social. You know, the bigger thing for me was and perhaps, I mean, this might be a question for, but perhaps it was social media that motivated those people to go and knock on doors, which is a possibility. Mm. But it was actually that going into the real world, not the virtual yeah, world, yeah. and face to face saying to your neighbour, please support Barack Obama. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a tool, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I want to I switch the focus a little bit because we've, we've talked about, um, and you and I talked on the phone earlier about. Uh, social media almost as a as a watchdog of the the mainstream media, as in Absolutely. you know it's way like uh, uh, That's traditional when it gets fun. traditional <laughs> media owners have tried to possess some part of the social media space with limited success, but it's also a way where you know you can point to things that are coming out of the traditional media, and you know and find fault with them. Do you 
I mean, what are your views on whether social media is just another source for the traditional media, or whether it will one day usurp it, replace it, you know? I mean, I think they're complementary. You, you can't yeah. say one is going to use up the other. I mean, the, the Guardian, all the newspapers constantly use new media for stories, for videos, you know, and stuff like that. But I think that there is a strong undercurrent of people being very annoyed with their mainstream media. Mm -hmm. And when they want to vent about uh, a piece of, uh, you know, journalism that is so, or generally about, uh, uh, you know, editorial policy, for example, lefties and the Daily Mail, then you, then you use social media to organize. I mean, we had this thing, uh, which was a bit of a fun thing, which was every time the Daily Mail put up a, a poll about something really outrageous, we would say, you know, <laughs> let's go and hijack the Daily Mail poll. And we used to do that all the time. <laughs> you know, you'd have thousands of people going into the Daily Mail website and just clicking the wrong button that they wanted. And, and, the, and the Daily Mail would sometimes take it down because they didn't want to report on it. So little things like that. But um, I think, like I said, it can actually have an impact on how the, you know, I gave you the example of, of the BBC changing their story. We're, we're looking to now uh, constantly criticize the BBC's coverage around, the cli around climate change. So there is a lot of anger out there. There's a lot of people who feel that the media is incredibly nepotistic. It's the, 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 the standards are not there. You know, they, they, they focus a lot on crappy journalism, which is journalism, you know. And, and so, so people find new media to vent that, uh, you know, to vent their anger at it. And I think that, um, and there's no doubt that the media is scared about it and, and get annoyed. I mean, I got attacked constantly in, in the pages of The Observer and The in, Independent when I was picking my fights with uh, Rod Little because they were his friends and they actually said that he's our friend, well, you know, why seen, are you attacking him? We've just seen that thing blow up today with Turi Munth, who's the founder of Demotix, the global citizen journalism site, and the NUJ, because the NUJ are slagging off Demotix for issuing what they call press passes, but are really just <sighs> hobbyist cards because people who work for Demotix or contribute to Demotix can't be journalists. You know, it's, it's us NUJ members who are journalists. And I do think there is sort of a fundamental level of insecurity when the media or any big organization are confronted by a, a mob, be that whoever it is, but online and, and able to vent their frustrations or their opinions. Because even though, you know, you're right, Ben, I think, I think social media is just people, but it has given people a channel to express themselves absolutely, absolutely. and in a way that just just simply wasn't wasn't there before I don't think I don't know I don't know I don't know I mean I'm interested to hear what what happens in Iran and, and whether social media plays a watchdog role as much with the media as it does with the government or whether people are just so focused on <coughs> the state there are two different periods in that period like a year ago uh, 14 months ago when on the eve of events uh, it played more like like the role of a source for, for media. Um, the access to Iran was banned to all independent media, so it was very important to get the information from there. But uh, then, uh, again, success of uh, social media uh, during that time uh, was very much down to the attention of tra traditional media towards right. them. Because what happened, like eight years ago, when everybody was talking about Iranian blogosphere, there was this uh, uh, local elections in Iran and everybody expected because it is local election it is in smaller cities at least in some of the uh, cities where the penetration rate of internet is high the blocks have some effect and and they didn't Ahmadinejad became Tehran mayor uh, at that election uh, again five years ago uh, in the first election when Ahmadinejad was elected uh, everybody expected blogs and this big buzz in blogs for when you when you were reading blogs, you would think everybody either will vote for uh, the reformist candidate or will boycott the election. But it was not the case. There was a high turnout, and people uh, mm. didn't vote for the reformist uh, candidate at that election. So uh, they didn't have that effect. But this time, the difference was tradition on media. They had. We, we had no other choice. We had to use social media as a source. And we had to pick up all these stories from uh, Twitter, blogs, Facebook, uh, videos from YouTube. And the important thing is we broadcasted that back to Iran. We, we broadcast it back to Iran. Uh, it means it, give, it, 
it uh, became more accessible for, for a larger group of people who did not know what is a blog or, or how you can access internet in a faraway province, but they could see the scenes of the clash on their uh, TV if they had a satellite dish, which many people have in Iran. And, uh, and also, it gave us credibility because, uh, you know, even if somebody in a province in Iran or a city, a middle, uh, you know, a middle aged man, um, wouldn't just read a blog and think about this anonymous youngster behind this blog as somebody who can advise him on his political views. Uh, they would not even uh, trust necessarily you know, the larger population to the videos, photos they would see because they are not technical. They think, okay, it can be fabricated, it can be uh, fake. But when it is broadcast back by CNN, by BBC, but, uh, by, uh, by these uh, big uh, brand uh, um, names in, uh, in media scene, it gives them credibility. I gave you an example as of uh, earlier. I gave you an example of a video. We picked up the video from YouTube. We, we verified that. And we broadcast it back. Some, uh, a person just captured it from BBC Persian TV, put it back on YouTube. And the version, the BBC version, had more views than the original version, which was the like 12 <laughs> hours before us. Because this one had like uh, a certificate. It is certified, it is verified mm. by BBC. And it was very important at the time because government also used yeah. the social media to send fake messages out. And so that was the role at that time. Now, you know, from your point of view, it is watchdog. From my point of view, it's a pressure group that tries to set the agenda for, for, the, uh, for the media. And it is very tricky in our situation. You, know? you have a TV, uh, you're broadcasting to Iran, and your journalists cannot travel back to Iran to even visit their families, let alone the yeah. field uh, jobs. Uh, so uh, how I can see whether our news agenda today is relevant to the uh, everyday life of people inside Iran. They clearly are, you know, the politics is not as top in their agenda as it was a year ago because you don't see the protests anymore or, or the activities in the, in the street. But if you look at the social media, you know, the only thing people are talking about is politics. Mm. And you can see that effect because our journalists also are living in that uh, virtual world. They get only a connection with Iran, with their families, with their friends, with their home country is through social media. So if the only message they are getting through social media is just a narrow political message, and uh, you will hear it back in the output. So it's a very yeah. difficult job for us to, to find a, a bigger agenda. So I can see the power of social media now. You know, you don't see the activities you had a year ago in Twitter, Facebook, but it is very effective mm. because it creates this problem, and because of that, you know we have to deal with it every day, I can see the power of that. Ben, what do you think? Well, uh, yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, it's quite humbling to be on the stage with you. He's been in that experience and been taken into prison, put in solitary confinement. That's quite, you know, humbling for me in terms of what you've uh, experienced. And I really want to pay tribute to that in in, in whatever I. You know, Satan up because we have to keep all these things in perspective. I used to work in Ethiopia. I knew what it was like there for journalists who spoke their mind and what they gave up. And I think we, you know, often are unaware of that um, in the UK. But a couple of things, two stories, and just an opinion. And my opinion is on that: will social media take over traditional media, etc.? At Duck Rabbit, we don't really care because we're having so much fun. You know, we love blogging. We don't look to get anything back from it in terms of revenue. We just love it. We just love that thing of communicating. And we've gone from zero, I don't know, 18 months ago to about 30,000 visits, including RS, in those two years. And people contribute. We have a conversation. So for us, it's just a pleasure. Doing that is an absolute. I worked for many years at the BBC. Um, which is great. I absolutely love making documentaries for Radio 4, but I absolutely love the fact that I don't do that anymore and I can just say what I think. Yeah, and that for me, I'm, I'm really glad we don't look to grain any revenue of that because I just enjoy talking crap on the internet. <laughs> um, like a lot but, of us. Yeah, but two stories about short wins that I think have are about longer impact because there are things that we care about at Duck Rabbit. One of the things me and David care very much about is photography obviously, I'm lucky to work with David, he's one of the best photographers in the world, but we're very much concerned about who takes photographs 
and the stories we tell. We're very much concerned about the fact that so many of the people taking photographs of the images that tell our stories about the world are white and come from very privileged backgrounds. So here's a, a very short story about that and a short win. Um, one of the blogs that I follow is called Reciprocity Failure. Have I pronounced recip no. Reciprocity failure, which is a technical thing for photographers to understand. I don't know what it is, but um, he writes a really interesting blog out of America. He's a guy who likes taking pictures of pet cemeteries, but I do like some of the things he has to say. And PDN is the major photography magazine in America. It's like British Photography Journal, lots and lots of readers, very very established, very. Um, well thought of and every year they run their journal where they present to the world the best photographers these are the best 30 young photographers who we must all you know bow down and worship because they will be the future and Stan looked at the list of judges when they put this list of 30 photographers together I, I had a look at it hang on a minute it's 22 judges all of them are white that's, uh, that's slightly strange, considering we're living in America, where we have this <laughs> diversity of population, and surely if we're going to uh, judge who's, who's the best photographers, we might want to look for a plurality of opinion and experience. And, uh, and he put this to PDN on his blog, and he put a comment on their website. Did they respond? No. Nothing. And then it just started to really bug me. It's not an issue I've ever given a shit about before, to be honest. But what really bugged me is that they completely ignored him. I think they had a good point. So I decided, let's see if he's got a big good point. Because he put it to them that it was some thought, um, sort of um, not cultural racism, what's, what's the kind of uh, passive racism. That's what he called it out. He said this is a form of passive racism. So I uh, offered $2,000 to anybody who could defend their choice of 22 uh, white judges on their panel. And we put that up on the blog. So there you go. If you can defend this biggest photography magazine in America, if you can defend this panel, then uh, if you can do it, well, I'll give you $2,000. And this then went around. I was pretty confident uh, that I wouldn't lose the money, but I was happy, <laughs> I was happy to pay it out because it would have been interesting. Uh, and this then went around the blogosphere, lots and lots of people wrote about it. Nobody was able to constructively, in an intellectual <coughs> way, defend this panel. Not a single, there's lots of people saying I was a racist. Loads and loads of people said I'm a racist. I probably am in lots and lots of ways, but on this one I'm not so sure. But lots of people said that, but nobody could defend it. In the end, because of the other blogs, because what they wrote, PDM put out an apology and said we fucked up. We made a big mistake here. You can't possibly judge photography without getting different experiences because obviously our experiences affect how we look at things and how we judge them. We've got to do better. We're going to do better next year. And, the, and lots of people slag them off even after they put out the apology, which is a slightly sad thing about the blogosphere is that nothing is good enough. I actually thought it was really good that they put out an apology. And the impact of that is we looked at their judging panel the next year and they made a big shift to having a more diverse panel. That's part of an ongoing story. These are all ongoing stories about gradual change over time, about who it is that tells the stories about the world we live in. Very, very quickly, the second example, which is perhaps even more interesting, is I was starting to follow a photographer called Marco Vanacci, who's an Italian photographer who's working in Africa. And he was funded by the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. Does anybody know about the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting? Okay, well you've all heard of Pulitzer, yeah? One of the, okay, one of the big names of journalism in um, America. And the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting do wonderful work. They fund mainly white, middle class, rich American people to go across the world and tell stories about the developing world. Actually, it's really good that they do that. I've got no criticism. It's important that we travel, see other cultures and, tell, and try and tell their stories. But they funded one photographer to go to Uganda. And guess what he did? He decided to go and do a story about witchcraft and ask a woman to dig up her son's body, uh, sorry, her daughter's body, who had died that day, so he could take a photo, so he could prove that witchcraft was going on, witchcraft um, sacrifice was going on in Uganda. And then they blogged about it. They said, yes, I turned up at this woman's house in the middle of the night, and yes, I asked her if she could dig up the body because I needed to get this forensic evidence, and I took the photos. And they published this, they published the blog. And they also published a picture of a boy whose cock had been cut off and had a catheter coming out where his penis with. They asked him to undress and lie himself down on the bed and they took the photograph and then they turned it into black and white and they served it off. And do you know what? Nobody said anything about this. 
Pulitzer Centre, Crisis Reporting, publishing on their blog. So I wrote to them and said, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit upset about what you're doing here, about the representation that you're making of people uh, from this country. I used to live in Ethiopia, it really worries me. Um, there was pictures of um, children who'd, so, who'd been exercised. I was a child who came from uh, a, a religious family who was exercised as a four-year-old. So I know what it's like to grow up in those kind of things where people think you have demons. So I asked them a question, they sent me back an email saying, oh, uh, you need to see the whole project. You know, because you can't make a judgment of a child who's naked with a catheter and his cock cut off. You can't criticise that. So we wrote this up, we published it, it went round the blogosphere. Within days they pulled the pictures and they'd apologised. It turned out they had no editorial policy, which again I questioned. And they said, we're going to have to look at this. So a quick win, but about an st ongoing story about how we represent it, about things that David and I really care about. But the one thing that I would say, just to finish off, again, one of the dangers of the language is by say, we did this. We didn't. OK, we did not do this. I wrote up a story. The same with the PDM. Somebody else started it. It went to somebody else. It went to somebody else. It went to somebody else. It was a collective of people who are very loosely linked, who just started to care about a subject. The danger with social media and organisations, potentially like Index on Censorship, is they start telling you that we did this, we changed this law. Bullshit. People do it. That's what it comes down to. People caring about it. They can't do fuck all without people caring it. it. They do a great role if they can bring those people together. That's absolutely fabulous and we should applaud them. But what we shouldn't do is let people start telling you we do this. Because it's, that's not the way it works. It's this network. And that's what's really interesting. That's why we love it and that's why we enjoy doing it. What do you think of that, Mike? You did say we do it. You did say we do it. You did say we do it. Surely non profits, surely non profits and non profits have to do have, something have or no play. one will give us any money. And then we won't have any staff <laughs> and then we won't be doing anything. And that's the point. I mean charities always have to promote their own do work. Do something. But no, we come on for No, no, no. Sake. In fact, I I'll be very clear. The fifty two thousand people that signed the Library Reform petition did something. And we put the money it. to host it. Brilliant. And that's the thing. But, but also we lobbied, we organised you know, meetings with ministers. We did the, you know, and um, uh, this, is the, this is the issue between uh, a charity, an establishment body like Index, who uh, you know, kind of work with establishment figures and social media. And the difference is, uh, whereas social media is geared towards quick wins, the slow process of going to meetings with, meetings with ministers and saying, Paragraph 6.4.1, you say here that the public interest defence is defined Sorry. out and our lawyers have said this, this and this, right? Social media will never, ever, ever replace sure. the role of Absolutely. establishment charities or establishment or even newspapers. Wait, wait, hold because, on. Because, they, because so at the end of the day, individuals can be very, very powerful if organised and if collective. And, and we I, weren't and I, funded. We weren't funded no, no, to make those changes. Yeah, nobody paid us. The no, point no, is, no, 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 but the point is, there still also has to be. There still has to also be professional bodies that, that take forward social media. Now, I want to say something positive about social media, <laughs> which is, it opens up a new grey legal area. And what's really interesting is uh, Paul Farrelly asked a parliamentary question on traffic era, and Carter Rock sent sent. Uh, sent the Speaker of the House of Commons a letter saying, if you publish this parliamentary question, we will hold you legally responsible. This parliamentary question is sub judice. The Guardian can't publish this parliamentary question. No one can publish this parliamentary question. The Minton report has a super injunction on it. You cannot touch this with a barge pole. And The Guardian went, we're not going to touch this with a barge pole. Uh, and, the, and the House of Commons went, we're not going to publish this parliamentary question. So no one would have heard about it. Not a single person. No one in this audience would have heard about an international corporation uh, putting together a publication of the Minton Report. And then what happened? People started twittering about it. Now, well, the Guardian went big on it first, and then as a result well, the Guardian, that, no, no, but the Guardian said, there is something, but we can't say what it is. Yeah, but it was but obvious. There's a parliamentary... No, it's it not obvious. It's not obvious. Happen. It's not obvious. You know, there's something that we to cannot... You, but it won't be obvious to everybody. That kind of thing. And, and well, it got out, didn't it? It got well, out. It got the, out reason it, the reason it got out As you say, is because the Guardian couldn't have published this. Now, prior to prior to the prior to Twitter or prior to Facebook, prior to social media networks, no one that you could have had Chinese whispers, and it would have been a very very slow way to spread the story. 
But actually, what Twitter did is, through collective action, lots of individuals, you know, well, were let, able, let, let, sorry, let me were able to link, were sure. able to link to the WikiLeaks, uh, the WikiLeaks version oh, of the WikiLeaks, and it was only That's because of social that. media that a large amount of people would have heard about this. This would not have existed 20 sure. years ago. So you look at you look at individuals. I'm not, I'm not denying that, but, but here's the problem that. Um, all of us are also uh, responsible, and I, I can be sued. And I've been, in fact, uh, sent legal letters twice by other bloggers. So uh, <laughs> actually, the idea that we could have published... So, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that we could have published the letter and... Uh, sorry, the, the question, the parliamentary question, and gotten away with it, well, it is, is just not true. What would have, w the only way we'd get away with that is if suddenly thousands of people instantaneously also published it, which is what happened. Which is what happened. Right, right, right. right. So on, my only point is to, so to try right. and sort of yeah. get across the point that actually bloggers are just as liable for, uh, you know, liable, ref uh, uh, you know, legal action mm. as anything else, as newspapers are. So we couldn't have gone out there. If I had gone out there, I've actually had rec uh, received letters from uh, libel lawyers saying there is a super injunction out on this. You can't even talk about this. This is to do with uh, an MP and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And so we not. I don't even know about this. I'm, I don't even publish. Uh, you know, gossip about uh, people's personal lives. And we already we got the letter yeah. from them already. So all I, all I'm saying is that should have sent it to Doc Rabbit. We'd have published it. <laughs> all, I, all I'm saying is that yeah, WikiLeaks is a fantastic, fun. really useful. Uh, a resource for all of us now where you can send stuff to but they are actually outside the law to a certain extent it's a very hazy area whereas all of us bloggers are very uh, conscious of the fact that we can be sued but this is where there are different forms of social media so as a blogger, That's a good point. you would not have published that. You would be mental to have published that. But as no, what we individuals, would have done is got emailed loads of people and said, "Can we all publish this at the same time?" <laughs> doing exactly. that, so there is no point in doing that as well. Would have been incredibly, but yeah. To be, yeah. But that's again quite high risk. I mean, what? But yeah. individual, individual people on Twitter, twittering about it, or or sending text via mobile phones, and what's you know, and social media, you know, lots of technologies have in the last twenty years. We've, we've got lots of new forms of technology. Protests in Philippines that took down the government were organised by text well, messages on mobile phones. I don't get that many political text messages. <laughs> I'd be really annoyed if I did. Oh, I'll, I'll <laughs> you right. um, uh, the, you know, all, all, uh, protests in Belarus were all organised at uh, Lukashenko's 2006 election win, all organised by mobile phone text. And Twitter is essentially the online version of mobile phone texting, mm -hmm. but slightly slightly developed. So yeah, I mean, we should remember that not everyone in around the world goes around with their BlackBerry or their iPhone. Exactly. Yeah, uh, and this is this every three and this minutes. this conversation is very kind of yeah. Uh, you know, it has a geographical Micro, weight. You yeah. know, and in Belarus, you know, the the, the penetration rate for Twitter is absolutely minute. Mm. But everyone has a mobile phone, and mm -hmm. and, and Twitter can actually lead people to text things and there's so there's I think there's actually quite an interesting I th also think there's quite an interesting difference between blogs and Twitter as a form of communication I think as well. you're really interested in power and not conversation <laughs> that's the impression that I've yeah, got yeah I know I am no you're but I am really I want to see you're interested in telling people what to think you know <laughs> saying social media will only work when we can achieve that you're very dangerous say, I'm, yeah, I'm, that's yeah. very she's, she's, that's she's you're like Starly that's not we <laughs> can I just say do you know what they call index on censorship what the fuck <laughs> that's right we're I'm, interested I'm, in power I'm because confused. we see yeah, order, we're, order. Order. yeah we're, no, 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 we're interested in, so we're God. interested in power because we see how it how it impacts on the individual but what about conversation well, you have a conversation in Iran or Belarus about how your government's run and see how well you do. This is why we're interested in the power structures, because, you know, forms of debate, and the debate we're having now is a rarefied debate. This doesn't exist in, other, in, in, in yeah. around one in three of the countries across the world where you cannot criticise your government, you now have no right to freedom of expression, and if you express an opinion about your government, you are detained. And also in the UK, I mean, just before yeah. the election, sorry, just to uh, just make Let's a quick point, just before the this. UK, 
uh, b before the election, we actually pointed to loads of examples on Sky News where they were showing, for example, the famous graph of like Nick Clegg getting more in like 35%, you know, in, in ratings by people who watched the debate. But the graph on the, on the, that they showed actually showed him lower than David Cameron. And, you know, they, they changed it later on after lots of people suddenly started tweeting this, you know, but, but the point is that it fits into this narrative that Sky News and the Rupert Murdoch empire at that time were supporting uh, David Cameron. Yeah. And, you know, we had this, uh, you know, this, the Sun printed this massive front page of like, you know, hope David Cameron is our hope. <laughs> Within minutes, people will start putting parodies on online. Mm. We then started publishing parodies and said, you know, why don't you send us parodies? We had like thousands and thousands of people suddenly checking them out and passing them along everywhere. People were calling it embarrassing. There were so many people posting parodies yeah, that actually nice. by the next day, a lot of people were saying, uh, even Tories were saying this is embarrassing for, for the Tories. The sun went so overboard. You know, so it kind of changed the narrative. Um, sun yeah, I think the key here is what you said. It is, it is a tool, social media. And so this tool has different functions for different people. You know, if you are a media organization, you want to use it in a way. If you are a charity or an NGO, you want Absolutely. to use it. Absolutely, we should be aware I, of I that. I think uh, you are totally right to say we did this because you are not uh, talking as like part of the social media. You are you are giving an external view to social media. So you did something. You did a campaign by using a tool which is social media. The danger in that is that social media, as you mentioned, it is, it is live. So it can get out of your control. You can start a campaign, mm. it can turn against you, it can go somewhere that you don't want. So it is a very tricky tool to play with, but it is a tool. It is, it is a different view than the view you have because you are just in the middle of it. You are doing that because you like it, you want to be in the middle. But for example, I love social media. I, I, I see myself as somebody with a social media background, but in my day, day job when I'm at work, I have to think about a, you know, the distance between myself and social media because I'm using social media as a source. I have to make sure that social media is not manipulating uh, the media organization I'm working in. And uh, I have to verify the, the information I'm getting from that because as you, you know, uh, no, uh, the government itself or, or other organizations can use social media to, to send Absolutely. fake mes messages out, out. So I think there are different differences here, but that's because you know you are creating a tool, and he's using or I'm using that. In a, uh, this is two two different things. And uh, about the quick wins, I can see your point. I can understand your frustration. You know because in Iran also people when have they they have these quick wins. What happened is. You know, a few months after election, everybody in social media was happy because they went out and uh, in, a, in a dark night, they just uh, chanted against government and they ran back to their bedrooms. And then they were reported that as a victory. What happened was, you know, actually, Ahmadinejad is still stayed in the power and uh, the opposition figures were in, still in jail. You know, not, nothing had changed in the, in the uh, in the political scene, but people were happy and people uh, felt uh, victorious because uh, they had these quick wins and they could, uh, you know, uh, magnify their uh, victory uh, by reporting that in the social uh, media. But in the long term, it can change the platform for conversation, and that conversation Absolutely. can lead to something. That conversation is the most important the thing. Most important. So, what, what actually the government in Iran, for example, is trying to do is break that conversation. They are not that much afraid about the posts you can put on the blogs, as long as the others cannot link to them or comment on them. And they, ca they have created this atmosphere of fear that if you look at the blog posts in Iranian blogs today, the number of, the average number of the comments on the posts uh, are decreasing because people mm -hmm. are not that comfortable to go out and publicly comment on that. But actually, conversation has shifted to other places where you share the posts on your Facebook or, or uh, share it on Google Reader, and you have conversations in a more manageable, semi-private area where you know who is watching you. So as you mentioned, you know these tools <coughs> can renovate themselves. We always invent new tools. So there is a place sometimes to invent a tool to uh, to manage this 
uh, small quick wins in, in a way that you are not interested in. You are not interested in putting a long term uh, plan, a strategy, and put these quick wins, but they are. But absolutely we are. I, I disagree. We're very committed to a conversation about diversity. We're very committed to a long-term conversation about representation and giving people a voice. We're totally uncommitted to the idea that we are the, you know, we try and encourage that conversation, but the idea that we want that to reflect back on Duck Rabbit and us, we're totally uncommitted to that. We're totally uninterested in that. And that's the thing with a lot of these organizations like Amnesty and like index and censorship and other it's condemn them all condemn okay, all the human okay. rights so speaking, speaking of conversation <laughs> we're going to open things over to the floor yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, there are some people with questions there we've got some mics if we can have the gentleman there in the blue shirt first uh, Frank Jackson world disarmament campaign um, and I'm afraid uh, I've been a uh, little bit sceptical of all this uh, discussion here. Uh, I'm a dinosaur. Um, I'm not on Facebook. I've never tweeted in my life. Uh, but I am a very active campaigner. I've been for many years in the peace movement and in the uh, labor movement. Um, and I would uh, love to have um, much more influence, but I'm uh, rather sceptical. I think the key is the term social media. All the things you've been talking about are a tiny fraction of what's actually going on. And it seems to me you have not made any significant difference to the really major issues of power and wealth and uh, discrimination around the world. Individual cases, yes, fine, g good. Uh, but nevertheless, in terms of the whole world situation, with 6.7 billion people on the, the earth, over a billion of them with no clean water, uh, wars around the, uh, uh, the globe, and, and so on, the world are washed with more weapons than ever in history, and you're not really having any significant effect. In fact, uh, I uh, would like to say that the, the social media are, to some extent, today's bread and circuses. <laughs> Who'd like to take that Well, one? yeah, I, I looked at that one. I, I think it, it's kind of, it's not mutually exclusive. I mean, some of, the, some of the stuff does have an impact. So if you have people in the United States who are working to get Obama elected yeah. via the internet and pu putting money through his campaign uh, through the web, then that has an impact on policy. You know, right now you have a lot of bloggers in America which do constantly attack the Obama ad administration on their foreign policy, on what he's done to, uh, not what he's done to close down Guantanamo Bay. Mm. You know, lots of these issues. Amnesty constantly sent out reports. You had WikiLeaks just publishing that uh, report about what's going on in Afghanistan. These are new ways to spread information which actually then change the discourse that people are having every day, which then leads to a change in the political environment. We can't just say, I'm going to start blogging and tomorrow we're going to have world peace. That's not going to happen. You know, it, it takes time to change the political climate, uh, even within the Labour Party. Can I just, yeah, just, I think, well, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, well, I mean, exactly. What's interesting is trade unions uh, have come to me to ask them about social media. And one of the things that trade unions could use something like Twitter for is to organise protests or emails to organise protests. Because actually Twitter is an incredibly effective way to bring people who may not necessarily be trade union members into a bigger discussion about workplace rights or shutting down a factory or shutting down a workplace or losing your pension. And actually social media talks to a whole group of people and, and ideas can be communicated in an incredibly cheap and effective way. You know, 40, 30, 40 years ago, you would have got a printing press, you would have printed flyers, and you would have handed them out on high streets. Now, I'm not saying that social media should replace that, but actually the social element of any protest is important. What it can do is it can complement it. And those ideas can spread very, very quickly for nothing. You don't need a printing press. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. We fundamentally failed about the, about the world's big issues about the fact that people don't have drinking water, you know, about the fact of how many people with HIV, of malaria. We've fundamentally failed. And this idea that social media is going to change that with uh, world population, 
how, 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 how do you, how do you say it's not going to change that? Media was going to create world peace and solve all well, the problems. I mean. Exactly. No, no, I'll, I'll give that. There is no, there is, but it just brings it back again. It's people, whatever it is, all of these things. Why should we expect exactly that? Social media to make any fundamental difference. We have to be changed. We have to be prepared to change our lifestyles. We've got, glo we've got climate change, we've got global warming. We can't get away from it. It's happening. Why it's happening, is there's still some debate about. But, um, you, you know, you're absolutely right. But, but we, 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 we won't, if we look to these as panaceas, they aren't. They never will be until we change. But it's a tool. It's not. It it's is never a tool. Gonna be it is a tool. So, right, so it comes down to people themselves. If people it. themselves can get organized on an issue, then they will change the climate, which then leads to change. You can't just say, well, this whole area of social media is worthless because you're ignoring the big issues. What do you think political bloggers talk about every day? We talk about welfare uh, reform in the, in, in the government. We talk about what is going, mm. going on with the NHS. We talk about those boring policy things, which actually sometimes don't get up on Twitter. We talk about how the government, how the right-wing think tanks, we published a post the other day about how right-wing think tanks published all these reports, which then the government adopted to push all these cuts uh, to public services. Now, the point is that you do change, the, the or you try and change the political climate and the media climate, and then that leads to broader change. And we are trying to use the, uh, the, the, the social media to organize people and then inform them about what's going on in their local communities and then get them to go out and protest and then say so they can share information via a website that we're actually currently building mm -hmm. about what what cuts are taking place across the country how they're going to affect your local communities how you can get involved i mean all that is social media mm -hmm. doing things and to, and make very, people. to make a very quick point like today i saw on twitter uh, uh, peter kenyon nec member of the labor party tweeted i've written a blog post about rule right like, so you know very very technical follow the link onto his blog and it was about uh, how conference motions are going to be dealt with at Labour Party conference in Manchester in you know, September. Like, incredibly like, dry and technical, but lots of people went and read it and commented on it and then emailed and went through and emailed members of the NEC and said, this isn't acceptable. Now, that would not, that was in one day, lots of members of the NEC, uh, lots of members of the Labour Party emailed the NEC. That simply would not have been possible 10 or, or, or 20 years ago, because if Peter Kenyon want, would, you know, wanted to get the message to me, he would have had to send me a letter through the post, every single Labour Party member saying, I'm a bit concerned about this, blah, 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 blah. And actually what technology has done and what social media has done is actually made these conversations cheaper, more accessible, uh, and even technical arguments like that don't get, don't, don't, don't get lost. The number of people involved in it is far less than it used to be when there was far more activity. And the meaningful. Yeah. But and I, I, I agree with that, but hopefully social media can be one way that you can re-engage uh, people in, okay. a, in, a, in a more, in a more deep, deep, deep and meaningful conversation. But I mean, a, a part, of the, the, part of the reason for the decline in, you know, lots of people were organised. You know, the, our, our society has become more atomised, right? So people used to work in workplaces of 3,000 in big factories. So to spread messages was a matter of being in the canteen, standing on your chair and saying, they're going to cut our pay, what are we going to do about it? We don't work in workplaces of 3,000. You know, the majority of people in this room may work in workplaces of 10 or 5. So actually what social media does is it's almost a, a sort of a reaction to the atomization of society it bridges that gap. Connecting people. You know, I think the danger of being a blogger is uh, you are getting locked up in solitary confinement. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Other than that. Yeah. <laughs> it's because you just read uh, the posts of the people who are uh, thinking Agreed about the same yeah. issues. That's a great uh, point. No, you, you also That's read the posts point. of people who have opposite views to you, yeah. but not the posts of the people who does not care. In, about the issues you care about and to care about something else. So you have a political blogger here who can give you lots of examples of uh, what other political bloggers are doing and, and you know there is a very very lively scene in that but if you had a techie blogger you know all you would hear was about the technology in the blogs. You know do you, you just get links or give links to the people That's who are talking point. about the same issue. The thing is social media is a tool but also it's a community of people, the same community. You know. It, uh, the way we, c we have a conversation here will not fundamentally change if, uh, for example, instead of sitting in a room, we just 
post it in a, in a chat room. It can change in a long term uh, you know, view uh, because it gives us uh, more chances to communicate with each other. It makes it easier to communicate with each other. But the reason that social media has not addressed the fundamental issues of the world in like how many years, 10 years time, 15 years time, is because those issues have not been addressed in like 20th century. century mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know? uh, Absolutely. We people who Absolutely. have not addressed those issues, we cannot just change ourselves and address Absolutely. those issues online. But uh, the, the mere fact that you expect that from social media shows that how much social media accelerated the process mm -hmm. to address those issues by making the communication much easier. There's another question back there. Hi, uh, Tom Hewitson from Telegraph. Uh, I was wondering, the panel's uh, been fairly positive about social media, but I wonder what your thoughts on the uh, investigation into Dig Patriots uh, earlier this week. And, you know, obviously, um, for people that don't know about this, right-wing Dig users in America have been forcing left-wing articles off of the website for quite some time. Um, and do we think that this might damage long-term journalism? Uh, I mean, okay, we could take a whole bunch of questions, but all right, quickly, I mean, yes and no. I mean, there's going to be lots of different ways that people are trying to game the system. People have been complaining about Dig forever, about how it, it, it you know, uh, it's, it's skewed towards certain kinds of stories. I think that there's Media Matters, for example, in the U.S., which everyone complains that it's only, it's got a very liberal bias. You know, I, my view is that if you have lots of uh, conservatives and you have lots of lefties who are constantly... Uh, attacking the opposite to say, you know, you are being, uh, you know, you're doing this wrong, etc., etc. We're going to expose you. Then you'll get some sort of a semblance of, you know, everyone being exposed, basically. So I'm actually not against this idea that, you know, right wings try, a uh, right wingers try and game the system. And you know, obviously someone has got to expose that, so dig then change the system. But um, I'm just saying, you know, a lot of people complain that, you know, left-wing bloggers only write about left-wing issues and they're not, you know, they're not linking to right-wing bloggers and vice versa. I'm like, well, look, that's the political system for you. You know, you've got Labour Party, you've got the Tory Party. They're not meant to agree with each other. They're meant to disagree <laughs> with each other. So you then make up your mind and the same thing goes for blogs. If you're doing a good enough job. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and if you then did a good enough job in saying this is what the Tories do, have done wrong, which is our job, our job is not, to, I mean, it is actually sometimes to say this is the Labour Party's done it wrong if they're bombing people in, in other countries. But um, I'm not going to say, oh my God, the Tory party is giving money to poor people. That's, I'm, I'm all for redistribution. So all I'm saying is that um, to a certain extent, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't have a, an issue with it. But I just hope that it, it gets exposed and then people can make up their own minds. But why would it, why would it mean the, the, uh, the end of journalism? Because, you know, you can't find... You can't actually... If you get posts buried from the front page, that means that no one will see them. Basically, mm. what you're seeing is the systematic blocking of left-wing opinion in America and what's, what's by, by activists using social media. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that social media is benefiting the political discourse. In fact, I think it's being hijacked to actively damage it. And I was wondering whether the panel thought that that's unavoidable or whether that's something that needs but to be tackled. Surely the, the other story about big government and Andrew Breitbart is a much better example of, of, of uh, social media hijacking the national conversation, where you have someone posting a video which is clearly edited to make a woman look racist. Then she gets fired, and then it turns out that the video has actually been edited, mm. and suddenly all Wiki the national. Leaks. Well, I mean, of that's the, a of the bombing in Iraq. Same thing. Sure, but you know, this was edited a prime video. example of the media jumping on an issue and then saying this woman should be fired because she's racist, and then it turns out she wasn't, mm -hmm. and they didn't actually corroborate the story properly, where you actually, and that's his aim though, his aim is to hijack what he calls the liberal media and then try and force them on his agenda. And, and it annoys the hell out of liberals in the United States, but I say to them, do the same thing. You know, I mean, not obviously uh, misinform people, but if you're so annoyed with, with the media, then you have to also attack them. And, and the liberal bloggers do a lot. I mean, they constantly attack the Washington Post for publishing a lot of uh, climate change denial stuff, and I say, great. You know, you have to hold these people up to account. 
you, the media is not a uh, a set thing. It's going to constantly Absolutely. change. It's going to constantly respond to what Absolutely. is going on, and then both sides then have to attack it, and then hopefully some way we'll we'll get to the truth and in, in the middle. And also the internet has an amazing power to uh, disseminate you know a plurality of opinions. If, for example, there is a opinion which is not being expressed in the mainstream media, the internet will just open up, and a blogger will rise to prominence and. You know, you, you see these kind of tectonic plates shifting where unfashionable ideas are given a platform because the cost of putting, you know, the cost of putting a blog up is zero or a fiver, you know, and so, well, and, then, and then, and then, well, yeah. uh, and then, lo you know, lots of people tweet and so actually what, it, you know, there's a real marketplace of ideas, uh, which is, which is much more accessible. Again, 50 years ago, uh, if you had an unfashionable opinion, would you be uh, would you be print, printed on Fleet Street? No. I just just quickly pick up. I mean, the interesting thing about Dig, but then you know we've got Fox News, we've got all kinds of. Let's get away from this idea that that, that journalism is this some kind of objective profession because it isn't, and in most countries <laughs> it's a dirty, 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 dirty business, a dirty business. So. Uh, people can choose to go. You, the story is exposed, therefore I don't need to use Dig. Or if I, I really like the fact that it's pushing, I'll go there. So there's a, there's a democracy in, in choice, but it's, it's, it's an interesting issue. We, can exp we hear it about Amazon, don't we, where people write reviews and we can expect, we shouldn't be naive, we can expect what we're looking at to be manipulated. There's another question at the back, gentlemen in white. I, I think just, sorry, my name's Matt Gladstone, not representing anything. Um, <laughs> the, um, I like you already. <laughs> the debate seems to be shifting to quite an interesting point of view that social media rewards the most passionate, the most organised, the most committed people within it. Um, and that is leading quite often to quite extreme polarisation of views and activities, the dig thing and so on. Uh, that might be great in certain spheres, you know, if you happen to be into kind of flower collecting or whatever is, you know, your passion. But if yeah, that can get pretty in, in, the, in the field, yeah, I'm sure that can get quite vicious as well. In the field <laughs> of politics, we know that that kind of activity and discourse actually turns most people off and disengages them and is arguably the reason that we've seen a lot of things we've seen. In that case, social media could be quite counterproductive. Have you got any examples of where social media can actually be more positive and bring people together and engage, if you like, the middle ground rather than the extremes? Sina? No, actually, I don't know whether I got your point correctly or not. Sorry, because of my language and uh, maybe I got it wrong, so you just correct me. But uh, there is a danger in internet, not in social media uh, itself, but uh, in internet and digital communications, that it gives uh, exposure to some of extreme views that could not be, uh, could not enjoy the same exposure if there was not because of this anonymity of the internet and uh, you know, uh, you can have some passionate extremist views, and uh, it is impossible for you to preach that in in London with like 10 supporters, but then you can find hundreds of supporters all around the world and, and, and then you can uh, uh, start to become a big thing. That is internet in itself, not social media, because the only thing social media adds to that is a conversation. Yeah. And my personal experience as a journalist and as a person is always when you are engaged in a conversation, you uh, will gradually lead to, to the middle world. I saw these conversations between uh, right-wingers, Islamist supporters of Ahmadinejad and opposition outside Iran. And, you know, it always started by swearing at each other and all these things. But at the end of the day, they, they have to listen to each other. It's not like talking in the street, you know, that the post is there. Even if you are angry and you cannot read it now, you will uh, sleep on it, you know, tomorrow you will read this and then you say, I, I, he actually has a point. You know, I think in, in BBC Persian TV during the election, one of the greatest things, I, I think, we did, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the greatest things we did was not just giving a platform to people to express their views, because that platform was there. That was not something we did. It was there, it was on the internet, it was on web blogs. What we did was bringing an Ahmadinejad supporter and a Musavi supporter just 
few hours after big clashes in Tehran and bring them live on Absolutely. TV, Brilliant. ask them to talk to each other. Absolutely. It was a very pa passionate, you know, uh, conversation, very polarized conversation. But at the end of the day, these people understand that the other person is also uh, a person, you know, an Iranian, you know, with the same cultural background, with the same interests in, in the everyday life in Tehran or whatever city they are living. And uh, we had people who, uh, who came to the program and said, I voted for Ahmadinejad. If there is an election tomorrow, I will still vote for Ahmadinejad. But I'm really sorry because of the things that are happening. And I'm very, very disappointed in the way that government is reacting. So I can see that conversation can bring the middle ground up, if, if that was a question, sorry. But, 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 I, but I think that, uh, the, I mean, that's nice in Iran, but I don't see that happening in the US where you most talk uh, t cable television discussions just uh, go a bit, you know, crazy. But I mean, the, Gu the Guardian right, yeah. does, you know, they have a comments free and they publish uh, articles by right wingers as well as left wingers. And but then it goes all a bit mental in the comments underneath. And so <laughs> you, you sort of, That's true. you know, I, I think everyone has to have their own niche. Our niche as liberal conspiracy is actually not to talk to the right. It, not that I want to, I, I want to not talk to them, but actually it is a conversation with the left about where the left needs to go and how to get there. So it is about looking at polls and say, how can we become more popular? What needs to happen? What are the intellectual arguments? What are the campaign groups doing? What are we doing? So, and then someone else will have a different conversation about what's going on within the Labour Party, you know, within the Conservative Party, within uh, the Lib Dems, or whether on green issues or whatever. So, you, if you want to find a, a space where people are all brought together in this sort of an umbrella, then I think the national newspapers are probably the best space to go to. But specific bloggers will say, "What is our niche? How can we be different?" I mean, our our, our point uh, USP has always been. This is uh, the new left, or sort of the left online. How can we then promote each other? How can we make the left into a stronger force in this country? And it's not just about you know singing praises of the Labour Party. So you know, you are going to get polarization online, definitely, because some people want that polarization. Uh, I don't have anything against it, to be honest. But I have. No I problems. think, in a way, that that polarization is is sort of a reflection of real life, because if you go to a party, there'll be the characters who have very strong opinions yeah. and will tell anyone who listens and then there'll be people who won't put their opinions in your face but they're always coming from somewhere and even though they might debate better with you they're always coming with whether it be because of their personal experience their ethnic background their religion whatever they're always they're all they're already have in some way an opinion about whatever it is and I think the difference is with social media is there are people who get involved and want to share that and want to be part of that debate and other people who you know, maybe don't want to, but if you took, if you brought them into the debate, I don't know whether they would be middling, you know, I think everyone has an opinion. I don't, I, I don't know whether this idea of kind of totally objective debate where everyone's really nice to each other and everyone agrees to disagree, I don't know whether that uh, is, is kind of a... But there is a, a difference you know, between... an ideal, I don't know. There is a difference between talking about a block as an individual blog or a group yeah. of some yeah. blogs, you know, yeah. like-minded blogs, yeah. and a conversation between bloggers for or political bloggers from different sides. The thing that I'm saying is that conversation yeah. can make the, uh, you know, can bring the middle ground more effectively than the real life. I'm mm. not saying it, it, you know, in one day it will uh, become, uh, you know, it happen, but. Uh, that conversation can help it. And yes, uh, sometimes they, we write a post and the comments go crazy, but those comments are there. Those comments belong to those people. And even if you, you know, block your comments, they have those opinions about Absolutely. your post. Absolutely. The only thing you give them is the opportunity to express that, and then you can answer that. Absolutely. And if, I don't know, 1% of those people change their mind or think, okay, actually you have some point and I can, you know, uh, be more moderate in responding to you. That is that is what. But you can have, also can have the other way. You can also have people who become radicalized because of discussions online. So the question is, you know, those discussions are coming from people who have those opinions, and they don't need your blog. They can put it on on their own blog. You know, the only thing that you are uh, doing is bringing that. You said that uh, everything that is posted on uh, Facebook about your articles will come to your web blog automatically. So they don't need to put a comment. They go to their Facebook page and just write whatever they want about your post. So the only thing is now you have a tool to see that 
okay, what other people are thinking about my post? Can I respond to that? Or maybe they have a point or not. I'm not saying 100% every time it, it will happen. But if there is a chance for that to happen, it, it can happen on social media much more than you know, other forms of media, mm -hmm. when there is just one way of communication. Any more questions? Girl in the red? They're both in red. <laughs> Kind of something that, that we started touching on a bit, but one of the things that I find really exciting about social media in these contexts is preaching to the unconverted. I'm a radio presenter at XFM. We're a music radio station. We barely ever talk about anything political. And I have a personal Twitter, and I'm not an enormously political person. And on my Twitter, I'll talk about how, you know, the new Everything Everything album is great, or I bought a really lovely pair of shoes, or you should go and see this comedy <laughs> show. But then maybe I'll follow someone, and they'll post something that um, I think is an important issue, and I'll repost it. And there'll be someone who follows me because they're into Kings of Leon, and they heard me say something nice about it once. And that'll cause them to go, oh, well, maybe I'll go and have a look at that. And I think with Deborah's example of the people at the party who won't necessarily sit and say anything, it's because, you know, usually they wouldn't necessarily be that interested enough in those issues to engage, but actually because someone that they're interested in for other reasons starts talking, that will mobilise them. And I think that, that and, and, you know, at the same time it can be maybe dangerous because they might be influenced. I think one thing that was really interesting was when a lot of people on Twitter changed their profile picture uh, to have a green sheen and changed their location to Tehran. And I remember that I would see people and think, I know that you don't know why you've done that. <laughs> you've just done it because someone you admire has done it. And you, you know, people want to feel good and they want to feel like they're involved in important issues. But maybe it's easier to read Heat magazine than it is to read, you know, The Guardian or the FT or whatever. And I think something that's really exciting about Twitter is that they don't have to pick up a paper. They can just read this one tweet and they can just link to this blog. And it will get people involved in a way that... You know, maybe you could when you, uh, as Mike said, stood on the chair in the canteen in front of 3,000 3, uh, 3, people and shouted at them. But nowadays that doesn't happen. And I think that's incredibly exciting about Twitter and Facebook because they're not necessarily political tools. People don't get involved because they're interested in politics. They get involved because their mates are on it. But actually it leads them to important things. I, I definitely think you can engage a whole different audience who currently are either apolitical or not even particularly interested in, in single issues. And you can see with Facebook that dynamic is incredibly clear. Um, my worry about social media is that the media is incredibly obsessed with social media and so thinks that social media somehow reflects society at large. Whilst I'm very positive about the changes that social media brings, I'm also very aware that the um, single mum in the tower block working a 60-hour week uh, is not engaged in social media and it's not her opinions isn't heard and there is a very large there is a very large uh, section of the UK population that isn't connected to social media and that doesn't mean that social media has failed or it's a criticism of social media it's just something that we've always got to bear in mind mm. that there's a large sort of section of the, of the people in our communities that aren't on social media so we've got to we've got to remember that it's a slightly kind of uh, Cattell narrative. But on, on, on politics, what's quite interesting is the, the role of the traditional media. Nine million people watched the third debate, the third uh, debate on, on, uh, the, between the three leaders of the parties, uh, and 30,000 people tweeted about it. Now that shows the enormous, overwhelming power of the, of, 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 of the traditional media. But what's interesting is that your blog or your blog or your blog can hold that, well not necessarily your blog, it's your BBC now, but, but uh, you know, sort of independent bloggers can hold those large media organisations to account in a way that would have been difficult mm. to, uh, previously, you know, Sky News is under more scrutiny, the BBC is under more scrutiny because we have these tools and so that's quite an interesting interplay. Right. They're not, they're not I'm not challenging your point about the power, you know, the difference of penetration of traditional media and, and, and social media, but the example you gave, there is something, and because many people give uh, similar examples, there are non, 9 million people, audience, as you said, watching that debate. There are 30,000 people who create their own debate. They are not same. You know, you cannot compare those uh, those mm. numbers together. There are nine million people watching the debate of three people, and there are 30,000 people who are watching the debate of their own. 
So those people are creating content, even if it is just one sentence. So you cannot um, compare the effects of that and just say that yeah. that so number is like 300 funny, times. 32% uh, of people said that they, when polled, that they uh, had a conversation about the leaders' debates in the pub. And 19% said they had a conversation over social media. Uh, now, what would be quite interesting is what's the interaction between social media and pub, pub conversations. <laughs> I'm sure there is an interaction. And actually, social media can act as a, but actually, very, very traditional, boring old places. The pub, which has been a feature of British politics for since time immemorial, since we've had, you know, since uh, 1688, uh, that you know that has actually remained kind of, and that's quite reassuring. But it doesn't mean the social media doesn't have a part to play. Got another question here. Hi, my name is Sarah. I'm an independent person. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Um, uh, this has been a really, really interesting discussion. Thank you all very, very much. I've learned a huge amount. Um, but I'm kind of disappointed as well at the same time. I am a bit of a dinosaur as well. But I also blog and I tweet and I absolutely love it. I'm immersed in that. It feels like a jet fueled rocket that I'm on. Excellent. But I think there's a risk, you know, of I can spend my time doing that all the time and it's just narcissistic and self indulgent absolutely. in a certain way. Absolutely. And there's a risk. We have a juggernaut that's coming down the road at us named the Cuts. Mm. And what are we going to do? People's lives are going to be decimated. And I kind of hope we're, we're going to need some discipline. We're going to need some to apply social media to the old forms of organizing. Well, to well, get we are. people. Well, I hope. That's what I wanted to hear about. Because, I mean, it's not as serious as what happened in Iran. But it is going to be pretty serious. And I hope that we could learn and move on and actually stop what's going to be happening to us. Well, yeah, I mean, look, I'll, I'll just give you a quick example. I actually set up an email list of various people from trade unions, to say, including trade unions, sorry, but also local campaigners, and say, all right, what are we going to do about this? We sat down, we had a meeting about we're going to set up a website to inform people about what cuts are taking place, people's personal lives, how they're being affected, and how you can take action. And if you want to start a campaign locally, then these are the tools that you need. What's the intellectual argument to oppose the government on these issues? All the rest of it. So. And I've posted about it a few times on my blog as well. It's like, okay, this is what we're planning to do. If you want to get involved, these are the segments that you can get involved in. All this has happened entirely via social media, then leading on to real life meetings and discussions and saying, all right, what are we going to do? Most of the time, we don't even meet. We just email each other and say, have you seen this? By the way, we had a meeting last night in Oxford about this. And you know, this is what came of it. So all this is taking place. You know, Don't uh, think that. Uh, people just sit around tweeting about uh, uh, you know what they had for dinner and all the rest of it because I don't do any of that I just I, I get bored of stuff like that so I uh, so yes it is taking place those come it together? That's what well I mean okay so so uh, I'll give you okay well Tony Obama's campaign did it, for example. Very, very disciplined. which one sorry about the Obama campaign the Obama campaign did bring it together for a moment. Right. They were very disciplined, very organised. They had subtle yeah. differentiation of the of the market and all that. How much that. did they spend? Oh, millions, a lot. Almost. It, so, so we have was, to do something yeah. differently, I think, which but, is. And also, we need to continue afterwards because we have to hold their feet to the fire. He's right. Exactly. Up. So, so our focus is to build a decentralised, localised campaign while actually trying to build, uh, connect people up and say, all right, you're doing something in Devon, you're doing something in Oxford you know, you're doing something up in Somerset, whatever it is, uh, or in Hackney. And how do you connect with the people, know what's going on across the country, what are the arguments that you can make when people say something to you, how do you know what's going on across the country, and then try and feed that into the media narrative and say, look, you're ignoring what's going on in personal people's lives. And you're talking about how all these cuts are great, but look, these people are actively losing their houses, their, their ch children are being affected, all this kind of stuff. So, I'm. You know, we are talking about strategy as well. It's not like we're not doing any of that. There is a discussion. I wrote an article yesterday uh, in response to Tony Benn's piece in The Guardian saying, all right, if, if we want to have a, a discussion, then we've got to do things differently, which is not, let's just have no cuts, so we're going to go out and march on the streets. It's not going to work as it did in the 70s and 80s. It's got to be done differently now. Um, and it's going to involve a, a broader swath of society than just the people that we talk to, you know, constantly. So those discussions are taking place, you know, and, and it, it will have an impact. And we are trying to uh, get people together and coordinate. And we are doing this right now. So, you know. Just to firmly take my index hat off, 
uh, which is entirely apolitical and it ought to be, uh, and wear my Labour councillor hat very briefly. Um, the, the, thing about the, the thing about the cuts is, in the 80s, to organise a protest, you would have created flyers, you know, as I said before, and actually it's a slow process. What social media does is you can have uh, a hashtag on Twitter, Lewisham Cuts. And every single, but no, but every single local organisation can feed into that. You can coordinate better. Email makes things. No, 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 no. Yeah, We're having a much wider tool. Basically, at the moment, we're going through a process where £60 million pounds worth of cuts being made right, to our council's budget, which is horrendous, absolutely horrendous. <coughs> um, but we're, you know, the gov this is what the government's telling us to do. Uh, with social media, we can engage the general public or a section of the general public, and I, this, is, this is the issue that I came out to earlier, how representative is it? But we can actually have more conversations, we can have a discourse in a way that would have been very complicated to in the past. But that said, we've still got to go and knock on doors and speak to people. But what social media, what social media can do is can take you a bit further than perhaps you could have gone in the past. And a Facebook group, quite a lot of the population have access to Facebook, it just means you can bring like-minded people together in a way that's free, and then you also do your external activity, the old-fashioned organising. Um, but I, but I, I, I sort of agree. I totally agree with your point. But I think you've you've just got to view social media as a tool, and it's a tool which is cheap, and it's a tool which is very accessible. I think we've got time for one more question. I just have a very quick comment, Roxanne Shapur from the BBC. Um, I think it's been an interesting. It's, in, it's been interesting listening to these conversations. It's a very developed world kind of perspective here. But I think one thing that perhaps has been a little bit overlooked is that the, the, the role of social media in um, facilitating hosting the narrative for context where it's the only place where the narrative can exist. And a good example of that is Cuba mm. and the bloggers in Cuba who are updating their blogs, even from inside prison. So, you know, I just wanted to also inject a little bit of that perspective into the conversation. I, I think that's a fundamentally important point that you make, and I think narrative is, is essential about how we think and feel about the world, and one of the dangers is we're often fed a single narrative, especially about developing countries and people mm. from developing countries. So it's not that that narrative is wrong, it's just we never see other ones to kind of balance it. But I, I, you know, I had the great privilege of living in Ethiopia, and uh, the truth was where the correspondents got their news from uh, was blogs. Yeah, there was a, there was a blog, very a minor post, it was called very, very bravely, um, very, very bravely run, uh, that was telling people what was going on. And the BBC correspondent would go to that blog and would publish their story a few days later, um, and and the information was 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 coming from there. So, you know, right at the cutting edge, because the BBC corris correspondent often couldn't say things because they'd have been chucked out of the of the country. And again, we have to get away from this idea that journalists, are, you know, have this freedom, especially in in some of these countries. So, I think it's really, really Im uh, f fundamentally important. I think that's a you know, great point. I think what's interesting about Cuba is Yoni Sanchez, who's uh, mm. this, uh, this blogger who's won so many journalistic accolades <laughs> and stuff. She's a celebrity around the world in the journalistic community, but in Cuba there's, a, there's been a really limited impact of her work because not many people have internet access mm. there. So whereas she's opening Cuba up for us, who can read her posts, Back home, you know, I think in a sense, in a way, it protects her because the government know how famous she is now, and she can't just disappear. But how much it it, it affects kind of the internal politics of the island, I don't know, and I'd love to know. But you know, you, it's it's hard to go to Cuba and ask those questions. So, but I mean, I think the very impact, the very idea that you know, the, the one who went on a hunger strike to get the other fifty-two released, in the end. Mm. prevailed mm -hmm. um, is, a, is an indication of how it's also um, affecting internal politics. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah. As you say, it's difficult to know with Cuba, but I mean, I think even Fidel's recent resurfacing probably has to do in some ways mm -hmm. with that, with her. Uh, and social media works all, I mean, it, it's working, you know, it has, it's had an incredible effect in 
in Iran in the sense that there, I mean, there are no journalists from Britain in Iran today, according to the FCO. It's not a single British journalist of, of Britain, you know, born in Britain. But not that we they can, know. Well, yeah, but we can read blogs. We can, I mean, fine. There's there's a real, but we can read those blogs, and if they're in English, this audience can make an opinion about what's happening in Iran. It goes all the way up to the point until you get to a, a full totalitarian state like North Korea, and nobody knows what's happening in that country. It's, enti it's entirely closed, mm. but it does have that amazing effect in you know in Iran, Belarus, Cuba, etc. China. China, if you yeah. want to use Iran as an example, as you said, you know, the main point, as I mentioned before, was uh, the conjunction between the, the, the link between the tradition on media and social media. Or in your case, for political campaigns, the link between political groups and social media. You know, again, you know, back to, to where we started the conversation here. Uh, it is impossible to expect social media to behave in, in the way you want. Social media is out there. You, as a political organization, can go and do what you want by, by using that tool. I, from a media organization, will use that as a source or way of promoting my, uh, my output. But the important thing is, if you want to make an effect, that link is very important. Do we need some tools to, to give it more discipline uh, for longer term projects? Yes. But is it the job of the social media to come up with that too? No, because they don't need it in the social media. You need it, I need it. So I have mm. to come up with a system to gather okay. those materials from, uh, from uh, all around the web and organize that. You need to c come up with, an, uh, with a system to get rid of all those uh, you know, individual campaigns in your mailbox and give an organization. And for example, just imagine if somebody come up with a system like what Google did to bring the advertisers to, to social media do, do the same with the campaigners, then you have your answer. But you wouldn't expect bloggers to come up with an advertisement system to go and get the, uh, the ad uh, or other thing. Somebody else created that tool. They used it. Advertisers have used it. You have to come up with a tool that you need. Okay, so I give think an example gonna, of tools. I think we're going to have to finish, right. actually. <laughs> Sorry to cut you off. Um, but thank you all very much for coming. I certainly learned something. I'm sure you'd like to thank all the panellists. And if you've got any questions, just come and speak to us afterwards. So thanks all. Thank you all very much for coming. And